So you're good to go? No questions? All right. We're in the final section of chapter four. It's Bayes' theorem or Bayes' formula. If you look in your book, it'll get to 4.8 section. That'll say C to C log. I don't know why they didn't bother to publish what they have in the CD-ROM, but there's a chapter of the text under CD-ROM. I've also put that out on Angel as a PDF file. And I'll have my notes to go by. The general topic is Bayes' theorem, or Bayes' formula. And it's uh, based on conditional probability, which we've been working with. And it's a little bit of a twist of how we've been viewing things so far. Now, the truth is we're barely scratching the surface of Bayesian statistics or probability. I mean, really barely. It's a whole huge field out there, and for a long time it's pretty controversial. But it's been used a lot in the last uh, half of the century. Uh, are you familiar with the World War II Turing and the Enigma machine? They broke the code. They used Bayesian statistics and probability. And it's becoming more prominent. But again, I'll say we're barely going to scratch the surface of it. And it all starts with the simple formula that we went over earlier. We took the rule for a uh, probability of an event in two trials. And we did a little bit of algebra and we came up with a formula for a conditional probability. And I read that the probability of B given A. Remember the event to the left of the vertical line is what I'm interested in. To the right of it, it's information I already know. As long as P of A, that probability is not zero, then I can use this formula to find that condition of probability. All right, some examples to get your mind set for Bayesian uh, probabilities. Let's suppose the event we're interested on, event B, is VMI is going to win the football game. All right, with no other information you come up with the probability P of B, probability of winning. If you have additional information, you can come up, you can improve that uh, a priori probability with additional information. For example, if you know the opponent is Rockford County High School, then we'd say the probability now that the I would win is the probability of B given A sub 1. Right? We've been thinking like this. Playing the Washington Redskins, you'd probably adjust your probability again, given that information, and you'd say it's different. So keep in mind we have probabilities before and after we have information, and as we get additional information, we revise our probabilities. And that, in a nutshell, is, is a very simple explanation of what Bayesian probability is all about. We update probabilities based on what we learn. So let's turn this example around now. Suppose you know that VMI won the game, but you don't know who they played. Now we might ask questions, well, what's the probability that they play local high school given that they won? Or what's the probability that they play Redskins given that they won? At different points of time, I have different information, and I can use that to update my probabilities. And so in Bayesian, what we're often doing is updating a prior probability with a posterior probability. All right, it's kind of fancy language, but it makes sense. Prior probability is that's what I know as of now. Posterior probability means I get more information, so I update my prior probability, and I, the way I update it is using a formula, a Bayes formula. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Don't panic, don't worry about it. That's one form of the formula. That's actually one of the easier forms of the formula. You can go up to math sites and it's about twice as long as that. Here's what's important to us. Well, I guess what's really important to you is that that's on your formula sheet, so you don't have to memorize it. Right? So that's really important. 
What's important to us is to understand what the pieces are. P of A is my prior <coughs> probability. That's what I know now. And this formula is a way of combining other information after the fact to get a posterior probability. That's the base from a view about 30,000 feet. That's fine for us right now. Okay? Let's take an example. And I'm going to use the example that's uh, in your book, or actually in the, the CD-ROM, has this PDF file. So here's the situation. We know in this particular county, 51% of the population are males, 49 are female. And uh, a person is selected at random. What would be the probability that, that person is a male? Can I it? Um, That's not a trick question. No. Uh, so it be 1 over 100? Yeah, 0.51. Right. That's not a conditional one. It's a straightforward frequency rule, 51%, 0.51. All right, so that's your prior probability. Let's suppose the scenario that all these people are in the auditorium, one of them is selected, you don't observe it. They're behind a curtain on the stage, and now, what's the probability that person is a male or female? Well, if you know nothing else, then the probability that person is a male is 0.51. All right, but you know something else. From behind the curtain, you smell cigar smoke. You have extra information. Can you update your probability now that that person's a male or female? You can if you have some additional information. What we need to know is if 9.5% uh, of males smoke cigars and only 1.7% of females smoke cigars. And we'll use those two pieces of information to update our probability now that now that I smell cigar smoke, we update that probability that person's male. And as your intuition would say, it's going to go up, isn't it? But what will it be? We can calculate that. Let's use our typical nomenclature for events. I have am a male, complement of male, uh, complement of am a not male or a female, cigar smoker, not a cigar smoker. And what do I know? Well, I know that probability of a male is 0.51. But I know more than that, too. Someone tell me in English what that probability means, P of C given M. The probability of event C happening after the event M. That M. So translating to our C's and M's, it would be uh, the probability that the person is a cigar smoker um, after you found out that he was a good man. Excellent. That's exactly what it means. And we've been told that's nine and a half percent, or point zero nine five, right? That point zero nine five is the probability that a person smokes a cigar if you know that person's a male. Okay? That's, a, that's an important skill. Translate that English into the, the symbols here. All right, someone translate that second, that bottom probability for me into an English sentence. How would I say that? Probability that someone smoking a cigar and they are a female. Yeah. So given that this person is a female, what's the probability that she will smoke a cigar? Well, we were told that. We said, we're told 1.7% of females smoke cigars. So that's that probability. Now I claim I've got all the numbers I need to plug it into Bayes' formula. You can trust me on this. Don't try to write down all the notes. It's up there on the PowerPoint angel. But if you plug those in to the formula, you get 0.853. So our probability that that person is a male has gone from 0.51 to 0.853 our posterior probability. We've got extra information, we update our probability. All right, makes sense, doesn't it? Of course it makes sense, it's math. Now, you can use the base formula at any time. That's always available to you, and you have a formula sheet. 
today I'm going to show you another way to calculate it that I think is a little bit easier. Then Monday we'll do actually two other ways to calculate it. These conditional probabilities are really important and uh, they come up a lot up there in the real world. So let's take this information and create a contingency table. We're familiar with those and if you like those, it's really easy to calculate probabilities with a contingency table. And my table is going to look like, let's see what my table is going to look like. So I'll have males and females, cigar smokers, and not cigar smokers. I recall a contingency table, I have numbers here that represent the, uh, the counts from my sample that meet these criteria. So I here in this cell would be the number that smoked cigars and that were male. And this cell that corresponds to the number of females that smoke cigars. And in this cell, the number of males that don't smoke cigars and so on. Okay. Contingency table is just taking our population of, in this case, putting in four different distinct categories. Let's use that information we're given to manufacture a contingency table. We can make one up, as long as we don't cheat and we keep the probabilities the same. So for example, I'm going to say, just to make the math nice, let's suppose we have 100,000 people. What would I put in this cell right here? Very first piece of information. 51,000. And where did you get that? Well, 51% of the population is male. So that's easy, then that means I can fill in this. That's 49,000. 49, okay, our goal here is to fill in all these cells, and then we can use contingency tables just like we did earlier. It becomes very easy to answer the questions. How can I use this fact? 49%, uh, no, 9.5% 9, 9 of males smoke cigars. Yeah, this row is the row that corresponds to males. So out of my imaginary population of 100,000, there would be 51,000 males, and how many of them would smoke cigars? Yeah, four, eight, four, five. All right, what's the other piece of information I have? Well, I know that 1.7% of the females smoke cigars. Well, in my, again, my imaginary population, 49,000 females, 1.7% of them would be 833. Now, it's not hard to figure out then. I've got missing cells, one, two, three, four, but I can easily add, calculate those, can't I? Because this plus this has to equal 51,000. This plus this is 49,000. I add those up and get the bottom rows. So with just a little bit of work, I've now created a contingency table, and I hope I've convinced you that's equivalent to those probabilities I had to begin with. And there's nothing magic about 100,000. I could have used a million. I could use 10, 47. It doesn't matter. I'm, since I'm using percentages, it's really the proportion, relational, the proportional relationships between the cells that's important, not the actual values themselves. Okay, well, we, we, we know how to calculate probabilities with these guys, don't we? The probability of M given C, the probability that the person's a male, given that I detect cigar smoking, well, I concentrate on my first call, would I? Remember, using the contingency tables, what I'm given is what I pay attention to and I ignore the rest. Well, if I'm given that the person smokes cigars, that's all I'm dealing with. Those 5,678 5, people that smoke cigars. Now, of those, 
How many are male? 4,845. That's the same probabilities I got before using the base formula. Things will be easier. You use either one. And actually, if you dig into the math, you'll see that what I just did here with my hands waving them around, going to that column, and then deleting the other column, and going to that cell, I actually did a Bayes formula kind of verbally with my hands. It's the same thing. But I think it's a lot easier to see it in the table. All right. Let's do another one. And this one is uh, interesting because uh, it comes up in the real world. Actually, I hope you're never faced with this. But I've read articles that our medical profession aren't always very good at using probabilities. So if you go to your doctor, hopefully many years from now, and you have a test, and he says, Mr. Steuben, I got bad news for you. It's positive. The test is 98% accurate. So should he write his will? Say goodbye to all of us? Back to VMI and see his old professors? <laughs> probably not. Actually, we'll see here the probability that he actually has cancer might be very, very low, even though the test is 98% accurate. Now, how can that be? Well, Let's, let's do the numbers, let's do the math. I need to know some more information. <coughs> uh, but first, let's understand this number 98% accurate. And we need to get our symbols and our events here. So I'll say, uh, C is the event you have cancer, N is the event you don't, plus is the event that the test indicated cancer. And minus is the event that the test did not indicate the cancer. That first sentence, translate that into a probability expression form. How would we write that given these events? Go for it. Is it the probability of cancer given that the test is positive? It's exactly that. It's not. Now what you're more interested in. No, actually, I'm sorry. I got that backwards. It's not that. How would they how would they test a test for cancer? How would you know it was accurate or not? Yeah, you'd have to get a group of people that were known to have the type of cancer that you're screening for, give them that test, and see how often you detected cancer. So when it says the test is 98% accurate, what they mean is if a person has cancer, that's the given, then the probability that this test will detected is 98%. That's the probability that they're giving you. Now you as a human being, what probability are you interested in? You're interested in this one, right? You're much more concerned about, now wait a minute, the test is positive, do I have cancer? They're different. Okay. That's uh, Let's look at those other ones. That seven percent. What is that? How would I write that in probability terminology? Seven percent of cases that tested positive. In seven percent of the cases that test positive, the patient does not have cancer. When the patient does not have cancer, seven percent test positive. So that would be a false positive. So how would I write that using my events? What's given? That case? Um, you've got a plus on the right. Yeah. And then, um, we're using N for not cancer. Right. Yeah. 
So that's a false positive, and that is equal to 0.07. <coughs> and the last thing we know, the probability of getting this cancer in the general population is about 1 in 10,000. So that's the problem that P of C equals 0 0.00, zero tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands. Tens, hundreds, thousands. All right, let's do the numbers. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to construct this uh, contingency table. And again, I pick a number here that's convenient. I picked 100,000. Why not? So if one person in 10,000 gets this cancer, how many in 100,000 would have it? Well, 10. Then. And how many wouldn't? 99,990. All right? First column's done. Now I'm using my next clue. A diagnostic test correctly detects the, can the disease 98% of the time. Okay? Where's the cell or row that corresponds to the people that have had cancer? This is right here. So 98% of the time, I'll get a positive a correct positive test result. So 98% of 10 is 9.8. Now, don't be disturbed by getting decimals here. That's fine. We're not really dealing with real people here. We're just setting up numbers that are in the same proportion as the probabilities we've been given. That's 0.98, that's 0.02. The next P, yes. Yes, sir. Isn't 9.8, 0.02 wrong? Because to get that many oh, points. 0.2. 0.2. I did that. Thank you. And I go and be so careful, too. So is that the same? The same second one should be 92,000, Oh, man. <laughs> and do this on Paris weekend, too. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, all right, I goofed down. We'll let it slide. You'll let it slide. <laughs> Give me some slack. Yeah. See, I don't give you slack, do I? <laughs> Can I <wish> early? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I, I know what I did now. I changed the problem. I started cutting and pasting again. I should have done that. And then you can fill in the rest of the totals. All right, so they're going to be off a little bit here. Apologize. I'll, update agent. Now we're ready to calculate the probability, aren't we? What, what are we interested in? The probability of C given a plus. The test is positive. How likely is it that it got canceled? All right. You know how to use that table. What goes in the denominator? How many of these, out of 100,000, how many would be positive? Yeah. Of those positive, how many actually have cancer? 9.8. So you've got calculators, what's that number? It's a small number, 0 0.0014. Less than one, one tenth of a percent. How can that be? Did I make another mistake? No, I didn't. How could that be? The test is 98% accurate. But yet, if you got a positive test result, it's unlikely that you have cancer. What's going on here? Who can see what's going on? Nothing up my sleeve. 100,000 people. What's this number represent again? No case. But a positive test result. So what would you call that? False positive. False positive. It only happens 7% of the time. That's not like much. But the cancer is so rare, the cancer only happens 1 in 10,000. 
So most of the positives are false positives. It's that 7% of all of these people who don't have cancer that are getting positive results inaccurately, incorrectly. And the very few that do have cancer, yeah, we'll get most of those, we'll detect those, but compared to all the false positives, it's very small. So the reality is, in this case, because the cancer is rare and the test gives a lot of false positives, a lot of people are going to be pretty depressed for a good reason. And from what I read a little bit in the literature, that actually, this is an issue out there in the medical world. Correctly conveying information to patients. And in this example, I've been updating it. Uh, I won't take you through it now, but the, the subsequent ones, you can see what happens if the cancer is less rare, then there's fewer and proportionally false positives. So then if you get a positive, your probability goes up. Or if the test is more has fewer false positives, instead of from 7%, it goes to 1%. That means if you got a positive, then it'd be more likely that you had cancer. But in this description we have here, the reality is not very likely at all. Okay? You can see they're all stuck. All right. Well, since this is Parents Weekend, I, I have a treat for you. And you're special. I didn't get to do this with my earlier class. But you, uh, so if you have some parents here, might be able to resonate with this. How many have ever watched the Monty Hall program? Yes, yes. All right, when I ask the question, give your, give your truthful answer, all right? I'll have to explain it for this other generation here. One of the most important peaks clinical of Western culture. It's a game show, and you can tell by his wonderful attire, he was back in the hall. And at the end of the show, Monty Hall will take the contestant up to the stage, and there will be three doors, three curtains, whatever. Behind one of them was a great prize. A fancy car, or a vacation, a jewelry, wonderful stuff. Behind the other two doors, just jump, which we symbolize with goats. Right? So if you're lucky, you win a car. If you're not lucky, you get a goat. Now, pretty straightforward probability. What's the chance I'll get the car on my first guess? One, one third. But Monty doesn't stop there. You pick a door. Then Monty opens another door, but that door would have a goat behind it. He knows which doors to pick. And then he asks you, you want to stick with your door or do you want to switch? Which should you do? Or does it make a difference? Should you always stick with your door? Should you always switch? Or does it not make a difference? 50-50. Right, think about that now. I'm going to ask you which you think it is. Call it stay, switch, 50-50, in other words, it doesn't matter. Has everyone made up their mind? How many would say stay? Stay where you are. One, two, three, four, five, six. How many would always switch? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many say, don't waste my, it's 50 50. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not sure if my numbers add up here. I think I'm going to be short. I'm going to with that. All right, I saw a smile in the back row. What's the answer? Switch. Switch. You played a lot, but you've seen this. All right. 
the best explanation I've seen of the Monty High Hall problem is this guy right here. And plus, he's got a great English accent. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to do a modern classic for you, or to put it another way, a modern cliche, which is why I want to get it out of the way. Today, we're going to do the Monty Hall problem. The Monty Hall problem. Now, the Monty Hall problem is very famous these days. The idea is this. We're on a game show, and I'm your game show host. So you're going to have to imagine the sparkling jacket, and we've got three doors. Now, behind one of these doors is a car, Behind each of the other two doors is a movie prize, which for some strange, inexplicable reason, is a goat. Now, our budget doesn't stretch to a car and two live goats, so we're going to have to play for something else. We're going to have to play for this Mogwai. So that's what we're playing for today. We'll just we'll put him down. He doesn't like the bright lights. So we'll put him down there. Now, you're going to pick a door. So let's say you pick door number one. Now, Monty Hall, your game show host, will reveal one of the booby prizes. So let's say door number three. So there's nothing behind door number three. Okay, now you've left with a choice of two doors. And that's what Monty Hall is going to do. He's going to say, do you want to stick with your original choice or do you want to switch? Now, you might be thinking, well, there's only two doors. Uh, it's 50-50. It makes no difference if I stick or switch. In fact, you are twice as likely to win if you change your mind. Now this is very strange, it's counterintuitive. This problem was famously posed in a 1990 edition of Parade magazine, and thousands of people wrote in saying it's 50-50. Even mathematicians wrote in saying it's 50-50. It's just counterintuitive. A quick appeal to intuition might be to imagine 100 doors. So I've got 100 doors, and I'm going to ask you to pick uh, a number between 1 and 100. Then I'm going to open 98 of those doors, leaving the door you picked and one other door. Now, how likely were you to pick the right door to begin with? Do you think it's more likely to be behind your door or the other door that I left unopened? Now, with three doors, it becomes a bit more counterintuitive. Here we go. There are three options. You can have the car behind the first door, and a goat behind the second door, a goat behind the third door. In the second case, you could have goat, car, goat, and in the third case, you'd have goat, goat, car. So let's say you pick door number one. And in the first case, if you stick with door number one, you're going to win. So let's put a, a tick next to that. And Monty Hall, he's going to open, say, door number three or door number two to reveal the boom prize. And if you switch and change your mind, you're going to lose. We'll put an X there. But in the second case, if I stick with door number one, I'm going to lose. So let's put an X next to that. And Monty Hall, well, he has to open door number three. He's forced to open door number three. He sees the car behind, so if you change your mind, you're going to win the car. So let's put a tick next to that. And in the third case, if you stick with door number one, you're going to lose. So we'll put an X there. And if you change your mind, you're going to win the car. So we'll put a tick there. And as you can see, if you stick with your original choice, you win one out of three times. But if you change your mind, you will win two out of three times. So the reason this fools you is because it's not genuinely random. If it was genuinely random, it would look something like this. Monty Hall would open, say, door number three without knowing what's behind it. So he might accidentally reveal the car. If he opens door number three and reveals a goat, that means we're not in that third case, so we can get rid of those, and that's what we're left. And as you can see, it becomes 50-50, if you change your mind or not. This is how the modern equivalent of deal or no deal will work. Right, now you put your college education to practical work. Make sure you all uh, get on a game show. But that is an example of what we're talking about, isn't it? How is it? Well, let me pose that as a question instead of being rhetorical. How is that an example of what we've been talking about today? Uh, 
uh, because he's giving you a chance to change your choice after he revealed that one door doesn't have the prize. Your probability, your prior probability, you can update it, can't you? Make it a posterior probability because you have extra information. You know he deliberately, now this is the subtle part here, I don't know if you caught it at the end. The reason you have more information is because Monty Hall deliberately picked the door with a goat behind it. It wasn't random. If he would have random, randomly picked one of the two remaining doors, it had no advantage. It would be 50-50. And of course, occasionally he would reveal the car. But because he deliberately revealed the door with a goat behind it, you have additional information. And you can actually, I haven't found, I haven't, didn't use that video, but there's some that actually take you through the Bayes formula, <laughs> update your probability, and you see that it's higher than if you switch, because you have additional information. So your posterior probability is revised based on what you know. All right, have a great weekend. I will see you Monday refreshed, smiling, right?